closed. Uh, it wasn't very nice to be a bit quiet about six seconds ago, it's not um, but good evening and welcome. I'm very pleased that we could, that we could take so many of you to come inside on this very sticky October evening. It's not often you can say that, is it? <coughs> My name is Mike Rowe from the University of Essex and I'm chairing uh, tonight's book launch and event, Changing Fortunes, Income Ability and Fault Lines in Britain. We have three speakers come to enlighten us tonight. Professor Stephen Jenkins from the LSE who will give an overview of his book and a few glimpses of the main findings. And then we'll have two respondents, Professor Simon Burgess and Professor John Hills. Stephen will speak for about 25 minutes, and then Simon and John about 10 minutes each. And I will ask during that time, you keep quiet, you bite your lips, you write down your thoughts, because after that we have at least half an hour for debate, questions, and observations on the floor. We will certainly finish by eight, but depending on the temperature of the room and the excitement of the audience, I may stop again early, because we have reception open to all of you and available in the senior dining room, which is on level five in the old building, not in the advertised location, but I assume there will be signs or some locals to send to take it there. Tonight's event is, of course, all about this book, uh, and I believe that the copies are available somewhere outside. And finally, I'm required to warn you that this debate is being recorded and may be issued as a podcast by the LSC. Let me conclude my remarks by introducing Stephen, our main speaker. From January this year, Stephen has been Professor of Economics and Social Policy at the LSC. Before that, he spent 16 years at my employer, the University of Essex, at the Institute of Social for Economic and Social Research, spending three of those years as its director. <coughs> Stephen is, of course, best known for the work we've all come here today to find out about. Analysis of distribution of income, and the way that income is affected by taxation and social security policies, and the dynamics of poverty. <coughs> He's interested in quantitative research methods of analysis of the income distribution in particular, and he has an interest in applied micrometrics in general, particularly survival analysis. The list of journals which he has published includes Journal of Human Resources, the Journal of Public Economics, the Economic <laughs> Journal, Labour Economics, the Journal of Population Economics, View of Economic and Statistics, the Journal of Economic Inequality, the Journal of the Course Fiscal Society, and perhaps anticipating the most recent move to a part of social policy, also the Journal of Social Policy. Stephen is also a big fan of Stata. <laughs> I think I first became aware of Stephen through my avid monitoring of Statalist as a master's student. He's published in the Stata Journal, and he's a prolific author of Stata programs, most of which either provide tools for researchers analyzing the distribution or tools to estimate survival models. He's also, also the author of an excellent course on survival analysis, which he has given to universities around the world, and which I believe he is now engaged in turning into a monograph, which will be a huge benefit like me, who will teach this course in the future. But I know now Stephen will tell us about his book, Changing Fortunes, Income Ability and Port Dynamics. Great. It's uh, great to be here. A little overwhelming with so many faces in front of me. Front of me, but I thank you all, all very much for coming. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the sponsors, as one should. Um, the, the Economic and Social Research Council have funded this work in two ways. One by funding the research centre that Mike referred to, my sock, not my shoes, but my sock. That's from Microsocial, my research centre on microsocial change at the University of Essex, and it also funded the British Household Panel Survey, which are the data. Uh, provide the data that I'm uh, working with in this. And I should say that uh, MySoc are co-funding this event, so we're very grateful to them. Thank you, everybody, uh, to my colleagues uh, from ISA who are here and others who contributed and organised tonight's event. And of course, in anticipation, uh, people like Mike and Simon Burgess and John who are speaking after me. It's very kind of them to come and do, come and do something. <coughs> so, no, that's the advertising. So, that's the book. You've seen it. I hope you may buy it outside, I'm told. Uh, less of that. Um, what is in the book? There is, well, there is a lot in there. And uh, I'd just like to briefly take you through what is in there so that you know what you're missing from tonight. Because I'm going to focus on a, 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 a particular part of the book. So, there's essentially a, an introduction that sets things up. 
Then there are three parts. The, there's something about measurement and data, because Mike, as Mike described, I'm interested in those sorts of issues as well. And, and in fact, I think anybody who is interested in these sorts of issues should learn about the resources that they're using to look at these topics. On the other hand, if you're not interested in data and methods, you might want to skip over that stuff. And you may be pleased to know that I'm going to skip over that stuff tonight. <laughs> the, the two main uh, sections of the book, though, are about uh, income mobility and about poverty dynamics. Put crudely, income mobility, by income mobility, uh, I mean movements from both all parts of the income distribution, from the bottom through to the middle, through to the top. By poverty dynamics, I'm looking specifically about movements in and out of the bottom, or in and out of poverty, as we've described. And uh, there's a final uh, concluding chapter which says there's more stuff to do. And I didn't say that because I'm, I'm an academic, didn't I? Uh, I should say that, uh, yes, that, that there are three, perhaps three important things to say by way of preface. The first is that. Uh, this book is about income changes within people's generations. Uh, people's generations, that is, it is uh, relatively short-term changes from one year to the next. In fact, I follow people up to a maximum of 16 years in this book. So what I'm not talking about is social mobility, as it's often understood, namely mobility from parents to children. So if you were, th you were coming here for a social mobility talk, sorry, this is not it. Uh, this is something different, and I'll argue that it is also interesting and important. The second thing to, to know about this book is that I'm some, looking at income mobility and poverty dynamics. So people's living standards are measured in terms of their household disposable income. Income, it's important uh, as, a, as the, the concept, not some other narrow concept. So, by household income, I'm summarising people's living standards in terms of all the income that, that comes into their household from all the people in the household. So it's income from the labour market, it's income from investment and savings, it's in income from benefits and credit. And because we're interested in the amount of resources that people have available to spend, deducted from the gross income are income tax payments, uh, national insurance contributions and council tax payments. That gives us net income or disposable income and then uh, we adjust those incomes to take account of the fact that £2,000 a month means a very different things for a family of four or a single person. So essentially we look at net income in the household per capita, and it's not just simply counting heads, essentially adults are counted as having larger heads than kids um, in, in terms of the adjustment. So it's income, not just wages for prime age men, so it's a broader concept of living standards and looking at everybody in the population throughout most of, most of the book, but I focus on some groups in, in certain parts. The third part, uh, important thing to, to, to know is that I'm using the British Household Panel <coughs> Survey, which is a unique source for Britain about household income. The advantage of the, of the uh, British Household Panel Survey, or BHPS, is perhaps uh, enlightened by a contrast with the way in which the income distribution is normally looked at. Normally, there is the government, through, through its agent, Department of Work and Pensions, has a big survey every year where it asks a set of people what their incomes are and produces a net household income definition of the sort that I've just been talking about. However, that's last year. When it comes to this year, it goes and surveys a whole different sort of people, uh, a set of people. And next year, it goes and surveys another set of people. So those are a series of snapshots on different people. What I'm doing in the book with the BHPS is looking at movies on people's lives. So I'm talking about a group of people who were first surveyed in 1991, around 5,000 households, 10,000 individuals, who have been, then been tracked over almost two de decades subsequently. And so we build up a moving picture of their lives with their income measured each and every year. So three important things. It's a, it's about within generation movements, it's about household net income, and we're looking at movies rather than snapshots. And that, of course, is why, why we learn about income mobility and poverty dynamics. But why do you care? Well, mobility and, and di dynamics have got multiple um, facets. And on the right hand side of the slide, there are three reasons why, from a sort of social welfare assessment, you might be interested in. Um, 
the uh, mobility and poverty dynamics. And related to those three, on the left-hand side of the slide, I've reproduced part of, a, uh, of an interview that was done between Jeremy Paxman and uh, the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, back in 2001, where they're arguing about um, income changes over time and what one should be taking, taking into account. It was a fairly aggressive account on both sides, but you can perhaps read that. While I just tell you that, first of all, you may be interested in income mobility and poverty dynamics, because it influences our assessments about how fair the amount of income dispersion there is in the current population and how much popular poverty there is. Arguably, you might be more tolerant of greater inequality and poverty the more that all of us have got a chance of getting up to the top or of not being stuck at the bottom. And there are various comments made about those sorts of things within, within, within the internet. There is another way of thinking about it, which is uh, to focus on each individual person's income growth from one year to the next. The distinction is the following. In the first concept that I just told you about, mobility is something where it's essentially to do with people changing their positions in the income distribution. If somebody goes up, that means somebody has to come down. The second concept, though, is a more absolute concept in the sense that everybody's income may increase, you know, so everybody may get £10 a week or uh, more, and that's, so everybody can gain in that sense. And there are elements of that within the interview as well. The third concept is a rather different one, and it's not thinking about inequality and uh, income change per se. It's, it's thinking more about each and everybody's um, looking ahead and thinking what their prospects are in terms of income over time. And the idea there is that if your income is unstable, that is a bad thing. So income instability is like income risk. So if my income fluctuates up and down a lot, that can be a bad thing. Okay, so why? Because it makes it more difficult to plan. If these, if these things, of course, are an unanticipated. So there's quite a bit of discussion in the book about how you take account of those sorts of things. Even if you didn't care about those three reasons, for, from a social welfare point of view, you may be interested in, in, in mobility and poverty dynamics simply because you're interested in other things. In the book, I argue that uh, knowing about these phenomena it provides better descriptions of poverty experience, however you want to think about it. There's an interesting and important differences, for example, between uh, recurrent poverty, persistent poverty, and so on. If you think about the process of income change over time and how it happens, you get a better understanding of the processes of exit and entry into poverty, and thereby get a better uh, view about um, policy. Okay, so that, that's to do with motivation. Now, what I want to do in the rest of the talk is to just simply talk about some, talk you through some of the findings, going down some of those headings. So to do with how much mobility there is, how much movement is there out of the bottom, and so on, and how much income risk there. And indeed, ha ha has this been changing over time? So let's start with rainbows. Um, this is, uh, I want to summarize here how much movement there is between income, one income group and another one, between one year and the next. Okay? I said there was short term movement, this is it. So the way I'm going to do this is to, you have to go through a thought exercise. Uh, yeah, first of all, you divide the population in each year into 20 equal sized groups from the poorest to the richest. Uh, so each uh, band of the population is going to, it, it contains 5% uh, of the population. So that gives us rows on a diagram, there are 20 rows here, each containing 5% um, of the population. That goes from the poorest, who are the poor, cold and blue ones at the top, down to the red, hot ones, down, who are the richest, down at the bottom. Okay, that's the base year, and I'm going to start with 1991. Uh, and you might think, well, where are the poor? Well, according to conventional definitions, at the beginning of the 90s, the, the official poverty line was round about here, so covering those, it was around the rate between 15 and 20 percent. So down in the blue, okay, or at the top of the diagram. So, how do we follow these people over time? Well, we draw, put people into rows in each and every year, okay, we, but we tag them according to where they started off. And, uh, okay. So the blue people are going to be the poorest 20th in the, in the base year, the reds are the richest 20th, and so on, and track them over time. So just to give you a bit more um, idea about how this works, so here is our base year picture that we had before. If we go forward one year and 
there's absolutely no movement at all, the picture is going to look exactly the same. Because remember, everybody's tagged, and here is their root, where, where they come from. The other thing that might happen is that suppose everybody got switched around. So the poorest twentieth went to the to the top uh, of the distribution, and those who were at the top went all the way down to the bottom. So you just spin the diagram around the other way, and you see you get the diagram, the rainbow up the other way. Another reference point that's quite commonly used is to look at the association in a statistical sense between base year origins and uh, a later year destinations. So if where you end up the following year is absolutely independent of where you started off, the diagrams will look something like this. You turn it on its side. Okay, we still got everybody in rows, but now everybody from a base year income group has got an equal chance of being in any given row. Okay. So those are, um, those are reference points, but how much movement is there actually in the population? I don't know if you want to think just a second how much, what the diagram, you think the diagram might look. Well, one, two, three, this is it. So this is, in the beginning of the 90s, because uh, I'm starting where the, where the panels started off. So this is the base year, 1991, wave one of the BHPS. We go forward another year, and you can see that there is a lot of movement. But this, the, the blues are moving up, and the reds are moving down. But it's not a lot of them. Okay, so there's, you can think of them, as I said at the top, there is a lot of mobility, but most of it is short distance. And at the bottom of the slide, I've just given you some numbers about putting, uh, so you can get an idea of what this means. So of the people who were poor in 1991, around a third of them are no longer poor the subsequent year. If we look at people who were not poor in 1991 and moving under the official poverty line, it's around 8%, almost a tenth. Okay, so there's a lot of movement. But you might say, well, what happened? You know, surely that's only one year. You know, not much can happen one, in one year. What happens if we move the pictures forward? So you get something like this, and you might think, well, your independence from origin as you move further, further and further forward in time is the strings are going to be loosened. And this is in fact what you see. So you can see that there's a, these are taking pairwise comparisons, and in fact going two years out, four years out, eight, twelve, and then sixteen years out. And you can see that there is, well, we haven't got those vertical lines, have we? And we can still see that there is some association with origins, but there is still this some persistence in people's income. So there are persistent income differences. So a lot of a lot of mobility, but it's mostly short distance. That's pictorial way, and I think much more preference to looking at so-called vintile transition matrices. Um, but another way of looking at mobility, you might think about it, well, um, is thinking about the more that people are stuck in the same place in the income distribution year on year, so your income stays the same relative to the average, the more similar would be the inequality of those longitudinally averaged incomes over time, and the inequalities of the income in any year taken separately, if you average those inequalities. So if you, if you measure that using a standard you know, so-called Shorrocks Immobility Index and in this particular inequality index, you can calculate these when you, uh, for various windows, and I've used uh, six-year windows here, and if you run these, these numbers out over, over the whole width of the, of the uh, panel, going from the beginning to over a decade later, you'll see that there's not much change over the, over the time. Essentially, this is saying that there's approximately inequality. The amount of mobility that there is from one year to the next uh, is reducing over a six-year period is reducing inequality by around a quarter, according to the Gini coefficient. But there's no change over time. There's no change over time. There's a sort of constant theme in, in, in this talk. If you were just simply to look at association between this year's income and last year's income using a commonly used measure of association like the correlation coefficient, <coughs> stats 100, for example, this is one of the numbers in here, and or some variant on that, you'll see that those lines are not changing very much over time. If you take account of um, sampling variation, they don't, they're not really changing much at all. So the correlation between this year, your income this year and your income last year is between 0.7 and 0.8. Yeah, that's perhaps relatively high. There is some, you might think, that there is some movement. Okay, so these are all movements over time. What about income growth? If we're looking at pe how people's uh, income changes 
uh, in, in absolute terms and where they all come from. Remember Prime Minister Blair in that quotation with, in his interview with Paxman was talking about he was interested in whether those at the bottom were gaining. He wasn't kept, you might remember he didn't care about what was happening to David Beckham. Okay, so what this picture does is line every first line everybody up in the base here. So this is I'm, I'm going to do it. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to do it for um, two 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 um, two periods. So start off in 1992. Line everybody up from poorest to richest. Okay, so we have the dwarfs down here and the giants up here. They're lined up in order. And this so the normalized rank goes from zero to zero to one. And then we just simply plot what the average income is at each point along this diagram. And essentially what this is showing you is that because the line slopes from the top left to the bottom right, is that the increase in income between one year and X, the next in terms of pounds is greater for those at the bottom. Okay, and this is, so statisticians might know this as regression to the mean, but the issue is how much does that diagram tilt? How flat is it? How steep is it? And moreover, did it change over time? So the first, the solid line is drawing a picture like that for the, a period in the early 90s, um, which you might remember was uh, not a Labour government. And then in a, in a later period, so up, Labour government came in in 1997, this is uh, looking at a period, the first spell of the Labour government between 1999 to 2003, and we move to the dotted line. This is a good thing in the sense that the um, at, the line is almost everywhere above the earlier the one for the earlier period. So there is income growth for everybody. The pictures have moved up to the to the sense. Well, at least the people up here are, are not losing as much. And moreover, uh, you might not be able to see it here. The gains are greater at the bottom. And so there's more about this in the book. So that you might think that is a, a good thing. There's income growth. The poor, the people who were poor, are gaining more, and they did so over this particular period. We can come back and talk about later what why this was, perhaps. If we're thinking about income risk, it's a standard way of um, thinking about uh, measuring this is to look at the so-called transitory vari variant of net household income. I'm not going to tell you how I calculate it, but just draw attention to this line, which shows the trend in the transitory variance over time in Britain. And I think if you look at that, you could say not a lot has happened. Uh, that may, you may not think that's particularly interesting, but I tell you that if you looked at the similar data for the US, this would suddenly become interesting because, for two reasons. One is that similar figures for this in, in the USA are about twice as large. Okay, so income risk, broadly speaking, in the United States, using a similar definition, is up to twice as bad, if you will. Uh, the, 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 the numbers that you calculate are much larger. And moreover, the numbers in the US have been going up. Um, so part of the book is, is trying to explore why, why these um, differences arise and both in terms of levels of trends. And you probably have your own speculation about that. Perhaps another way of thinking about it is just simply to focus on a very simple measure of change. That is, what is the chances of experiencing a large income fall between one year and the next? Uh, what is a large income fall? Well, I reckon a fall by at least a quarter is pretty big, and by a half is pretty big too. <coughs> if you can see the numbers here, around that around 12% in Britain experiencing this over over time, uh, for a fall of around at least a quarter, and uh, much smaller for those experiencing a, a drop of around at least a half. If you go to the United States, those pictures are much higher, and there is an upward trend. The next thing I want to look at is to focus from looking at the whole of the distribution to look at movements at the, at, in and out of the bottom. And what I want to do so is use it is using a pop, the official poverty line in Britain, which is six, which is essentially six, sixty percent of the, the middle income in any given year, defined in the way that I've been talking about. Um, so what's been happening to poverty persistence? Or if we use a standard uh, window again, look over a four-year period in people's lives and count how many times people are poor. Is it zero, or once, twice, or three or four times? And the conventional definition of Britain is to refer to at least three or four times in this window is up uh, to count as persistent poverty. So the top line up here is telling us about the, the, the number of people who are never poor over a window. And you can see it's um, 
just it's, it's, it, as it says up here, it's moving from around 65% to 70%. But the, the point I would also point out is that that, that that means that the proportion of people who are experiencing poverty in at least one year over this four period, a four year period, is around a third. Okay? So over a four year period, around a third of people are experiencing a drop into poverty according to the official definition, which is probably much more than you expect. So the headline is, as I say up there, the group of people who are the poor are not the same people from one year to the next. There's a lot of term. In terms of the number of people who are poor at least three years out of four, it's, the number is around 15%, dropping over this period to 10%. Just to give you some numbers on this, the proportion of people who are uh, touched by poverty over a four-year period it has, in fact, dec declined between the early 90s and the mid-2000s. I told you about the 35 to 30% number before. This was particularly so for a uh, couple with kids' families. Families with kids, and you can see for dependent children themselves, the numbers fall from around 40% to 35%. And it's still quite a large number, perhaps, we think. And the other group that have gained are single pensioners. Um, so, you might say, well, what's driving all this? What, what's happening? Um, the short answer is that it's to do with labour earnings, of course. I mean, for most, most, for most working age families, Income from the labour market is the most important component of the household income package. But that's not everything. Um, so you can think of from one year to the next, if everybody is lined up across the income range, you can think of it like a, what I think of as a rubber band model. At each point along from the income distribution from top to the bottom, there are a series of tethers, sort of nails, on the income board from top to bottom. And people are attached to those, to those tethers with, with a rubber band. And then, a bit like bungee, from each year, people are bouncing around their particular tether from one year to the next. And we, when we observe them, there is what economists would call transitory variation, sort of blips going up and down from one year to the next. And some of this, of course, to us who are actually running the survey, we will have measurement error as well. So that's a small part of it. But big things do happen in people's lives. And it's things like that that lead to rubber bands perishing, stretching a bit more, and rubber bands breaking. So one way of thinking about it is in terms of so-called trigger events associated with movements into and out of low income. And I've listed some of the events down here that are classified. So changes, if you go inside a family, to the changes in the head's labour earnings, the changes in the labour earnings of other people in the household, non-labour income, so it includes things like uh, investment and saving income, benefits and tax credits, or the one perhaps I'd like to draw your attention to because you might not have thought about it, demographic events. So this is when people form partnerships and start living together. It's when partnerships break up, marital splits, divorce, and so on. It's when kids move out of households. It's when kids are born to households, and so on. These things affect income, people's lives, how they work, and just simply their ability to generate income, the benefits that come on, and, and so on. So here this is classifying in two different periods uh, the main events that are associated with movements out of poverty, so these are basically good events, and over on the other side we've got poverty entries, and so these are income falls, bad events if you will, income, so earnings may fall because people lose their job or simply because they're working fewer hours and so on. Okay, so the numbers are relatively large for both exits and entries for earnings, and you can see it's approximately a it's around 60% and, and it hasn't changed over time uh, when we're looking at exits. The key thing I draw your attention to is the large proportion, more than you might think, there is associated with demographic effects that are going on in people's households. And this is particularly so for poverty entries. Okay, so that is particularly important thing to remember. And by the way, Britain is not unique in this. This has also been found in the US. What about the longer term? Let's step back a bit and think a bit more about um, people's income over a longer period. Remember, I'm following these people for up to 16 years. And you know, one, of, one of the differences, not simply in one year changes, but people's income trajectories over time. What you can do with statistical models is get an idea. You can classify people into groups according to characteristics like their education level, sex, birth, birth cohort, and fit trajectories for different groups. So these are average trajectories. And what I would do, draw your attention to, for so men and women, well, let's focus on the earlier birth, birth cohort, the dark lines. This is the 1955 K 
plus people born at 55 and after, you can see these, these different lines correspond to different levels of education. So if we think about um, these trajectories, what, you, what you'll see is that clearly education is a good thing. So I'm most telling you because you're at the LSE. Is, uh, <laughs> a wise thing. And, you can, but do, and notice that it, this is true for both men and women, but note that the pictures for men, typically above those for women, the trajectories are lie above. And the other things I would draw your attention to is the differences in the way these things are sloped between men and women. Look in particular about the difference, how the things flatten off in the childbearing years. For, for women. These are clearly averages, but it, it brings it out rather starkly, these differences in longer-term longer tra trajectories. And this is, I should say, is not the sort of picture that you would get if you were simply looking at cross-sectional data. This is following people over time. So, that brings me to the end. Uh, a bit of a rush, I'm sorry, but the, the, the take-home points. There's a lot of income mobility from one year to the next, but it's mostly short distance. There is a lot of turnover among the people who are poor, um, but on the other hand, that also means that a significant minority of people experience poverty over a period of just a few years. Has income mobility changed over time in Britain, according to the way I've defined it? Well, it all depends on how you measure it. As you know, it's, uh, just as in social mobility discussions, the concept of mobility is pretty slippery. It is too within generations. According to individual income growth, by for example, the mobility is gone. If we focus, however, on the bottom, look at movement in and out of poverty, poverty persistence has declined slightly since the, the late 1990s. Has policy had anything to do with it? Well, yes, I would say that Labour's uh, welfare to work and make work pay policies are smoking guns, but I would also say that the state of the economy was, is also particularly important in, in providing governments with the ability to, or uh, much more freedom to do various things, and this, discussion in the book about the difficulty of um, separating those uh, different effects and more generally whether or not the sort of analysis that I can do um, isolates particular policy effects. I should also finish with a big caveat. My data run through to 2006 and we know that lots has happened since 2006. In particular, there's the thing that the financial crisis at the end of the 2007 turned into the Great Recession. Uh, and we've also had a change of government, and this gov new government has got lots of proposals for changing people's incomes, in particular through benefit reform and so on. So there is a, a lot happening uh, and a lot to research. Thank you very Stephen, so uh, for our first uh, respondent, we have Professor Simon Burgess. Simon is Professor of Economics at the University of Bristol, where he is Director of the Centre for Market Optimization. Simon is a Labour economist who has published on poverty dynamics, the subject of Stephen's work, but is now, what is now more better, better known sorry, for his research on education policy in general and the performance of teachers and schools in particular. And Simon will give the first response. Um, well, I was delighted that Stephen asked me to uh, say a few words here about this book. I don't think I'm going to take uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I think this is a great book. I think it's a book that any scholar would be very proud to have written. I think that not only uh, people who are thinking about income dynamics and income <coughs> dynamics policy now will be reading it and learning from it, but I think also the next generation of researchers working on this, so, so maybe some of you, will also have to start from here uh, as, the, as the, the foundation for their studies. So I think uh, John is going to talk about some of the policy implications of all this work. I'm going to focus on a couple of more uh, technical issues in the book around the data and around the modeling approaches. So on the data, I think the book provides a very detailed, very thorough and authoritative account of the, the British Household Panel uh, study, the BHPS, and the income data that Stephen's work is, is focused on around that. He talks about the nature of the data set, the strengths and the weaknesses, what you should use it for, what perhaps you should use something else for. He talks about how the income measures are constructed in the first place, a lot of careful detail and careful thought on that, uh, and validation against other data sources and so on. All this kind of really important foundational work that needs to be done uh, for people to, to find these studies uh, believable. So I think there are many technical issues as well that need to be dealt with in this data. 
uh, issues that maybe quite a lot of us kind of skirt around in our own work or sort of get roughly right. And in this book, they are kind of absolutely nailed down with a lot of authority. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, the book is about income, but maybe we should think about consumption. Should we use income or consumption to measure people's well-being? And should we be concerned about inequalities in consumption? What are the reasons for choosing income rather than consumption? <coughs> what about the time frame? Uh, the, the book and all, all Stephen's work uses uh, current income, income right now, as opposed to adding up income over the, over the year using annual income. What about very short measures of income, quarterly income, monthly, that kind of thing. All of these are issues that have to be thought about and decisions are made on what's the best way to, to do the analysis. Um, how do we equivalise? How do we compare the income of a one-person household and a six-person household? It's not, it's not straightforward. What, what should be the unit, unit of analysis? Should we be following individuals or households or families? What should we be doing here? Again, there are questions that you need to think about at the beginning of setting out on, on this sort of study. Now, obviously, if we're talking about household income, the unit has to be a household. But if you think about it for a moment, in a longitudinal study, you can't really follow a household, because households actually don't last very long. Either uh, children, as Stephen says, children are born to the, the household, so it changes. Children <coughs> leave, there's a marriage, there's a divorce, there's a separation. Households actually, as a fixed unit, don't last very long. The only thing you can actually truly follow through time is an individual. So what we end up with is individual dynamics following people with a measure of household income. And there are all sorts of issues you have to think about when you're doing that. Uh, the last point on the data is that you could read this book and you could think that Stephen has simply kind of downloaded this data from the, from the BHPS, from, from the, the ISA website, and struggled his work. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. As director of ISA, Stephen was a really big part of making sure this, this whole thing happened and this data was available. And it's his work on um, defining the right way to measure net household income that everybody else using this data set now follows. Okay, so there's, a, there's a, a good deal of modesty in this discussion of the data. <coughs> Thinking about modelling approaches, uh, Stephen makes the case for a longitudinal approach, and I really don't think that anyone now disputes that that is the most useful, the most important way of analysing such data. Knowing that the poverty rate is 10% really doesn't get you very far. Is it 10% because 10% of people are permanently poor, or is it 10% because we're all the same and each of us spends 10% of our life being poor? Clearly, the experience of poverty and the response to poverty and policies to poverty differ completely between those two extremes. Okay, so trying to understand which of those is closer to the truth or whereabouts in a complicated middle uh, is really important. Stephen quotes David Elwood from the Harvard Kennedy School, who says that taking that a little bit further, a dynamic view makes you think about causes. Well, why did someone's income fall? Why did it rise? Why did they fall into poverty? How did they escape? Whereas a static view makes you think of a, a lump of people, a group of people, and you think about, well, what are they like, these people who are poor? This gives you a completely different perspective. So the book considers income mobility in a lot of detail, different perspectives, income as a change in relative position, as we saw with the, the rainbow pictures, uh, mobility as a reduction in inequality, again, thinking about how people's lifetime experience is different from a, from a one-off snapshot. And there are all sorts of sort of uh, um, all sorts of different technical modelling approaches going on in this book. There are uh, panel data models, random effects panel data models, hazard models of duration, how long do people stay in poverty, and uh, Markov transition models. And as as Mike said in his introduction, many of these things Stephen has written up in state a do file, so the rest of us don't have to do that work and can just build on what he's done. The final thing I want to say really is. And one of the basic divides in the way people analyse poverty is between a reduced form approach and a, and a more structural approach. What Stephen's, uh, Stephen's work in this book is very much a, a reduced form approach. Let's think about poverty, let's think about income mobility, and that's fine. On the other hand, other people are trying to do something slightly more structural, and there are obviously attractions to do that, as, as Stephen discusses in the book. You can think about more kind of behavioural parameters um, but it's very, very hard. 
And actually, what was true in the very early studies of income dynamics, from Lillard and Willis in the late 1970s, is as true uh, 30 years later in work that Richard Blundell and others have been doing in, in, uh, two or three years ago. Really, the only way you can do a full-blown structural approach thinking about income dynamics, income mobility, is if you really, really restrict the sample. So these studies look at poverty amongst <coughs> always employed, always married men. And for that group of people, poverty really isn't a big issue. Okay, so you can apply the techniques if you make the sample really quite interesting. So I think you have to, you have to look for some kind of middle ground, some work that, that uh, some co-authors and I did tried to do that. And we tried to think about how you can model poverty by not modeling poverty thinking about the sorts of things people actually have some traction over. Uh, so whether they have got a job, whether they don't have a job, whether they're married or single, whether they've got kids or not kids, and you put all those together, um, and from that you can build on a model of poverty. And that fits really well with the kind of approach that Stephen's taken in this book. So the very final thing I want to say is I think the mark of a, a true scholar is someone who not simply, simply does their own work in a particular field, but does a lot of sort of services to the, to the profession around that work. And clearly in the terms of the work that Stephen's done around getting the data available, thinking about all of these issues around income mobility, and the, the modeling approaches and how those are now available as, as state files, I think uh, really exemplifies uh, a true scholar. Um. Well, first of all, can I join um, Simon in um, both welcoming and congratulating um, Stephen um, on releasing this book, which um, there are many of you in the audience who um, I think will have it recommended um, on your meeting lists, um, not just this year, but um, many years to come. Um, but of course, what we're, what we're seeing here isn't just the product of Stephen's work um, over the last uh, year or so, um, it actually covers areas that he's been working on and pioneering um, for the last 20 years, um, really since the, the first years of the British House of Patent Study made this kind of analysis possible in this country. But I think, and I'm just going to say a few things about why I think it's particularly timely for people to be thinking about this sort of issue right now um, in policy terms. Um, and why I think it's so important for people to get hold of the kind of ideas that um, Stephen was talking about in the book in terms of understanding the environment within which policy is made. Um, when um, the first results came out um, looking at income transitions in just the first two um, waves of British House or Panel study, um, it did um, cause some frissons. And um, one of the people it, it, um, who leapt on those first results, quoted by um, Stephen in the book, um, was the then Secretary of State for Social Security, Mr. Peter Lilly, um, who, rather oh, amazingly, was giving a speech in Southwark Cathedral um, on the 13th of June 1996. And looking at the data, and uh, we flip back a few slides, if I can do that, essentially what he was looking at um, were the data that Stephen presented here. Um, and I think possibly at a time when the then Conservative government was rather sensitive about the way in which inequality and poverty had increased um, over the um, 15 years that they, they had at that point been in government, um, he leapt upon this, the, 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 these sort of uh, results and argued that social mobility is considerable. Discussion about poverty is often based on the assumption that the figures for households on low incomes describe a static group of people trapped in poverty, unable to escape and get in for it. However, this picture has been blown apart by recent studies. They show that the people in the lowest income category are not the same individuals as they were last year, still less 15 years ago. Uh, well, up to a point, Mr. Lilly. Um, as Stephen has just shown, it's not quite like that. Um, those areas of red and blue have not merged into a sort of continual shade of purple or the, or the vertical stripes um, that would have represented um, the perfect mobility. Um, people do change their position from year to year, but not necessarily that far. Um, we can't argue, in terms of one of the first questions there, 
that you don't need to worry about poverty and inequality because everybody's going to get a go as long as they wait their turn. Uh, now that was the rhetoric of uh, 15 years ago, early in the life of animal study. Actually, more recent discussion has gone in completely the other direction. Um, if you've been in, if you were in Britain over the, over the over August, over, over the summer, and possibly even abroad, if you um, if you saw cover of it, coverage of what was happening here in August, um, this country, characterised as broken Britain, is characterised by a sometimes described as feral, um, sometimes rioting underclass, um, made up of people where three generations of people have been unemployed continuously. Uh, now I can see people who've worked on BHPS. Is there a single family within the BHPS that have had three generations, out of the 5,000 that have had three generations continuously unemployed through the years of the survey? Um, I would find that very surprising. But that is part of the image of that's used to discuss policy and policy choice at the moment. That there is this, um, that there is this um, unchanging, cut-off um, underclass um, that is not part of the mainstream. Well, again, that is not the kind of picture that, that Steve um, is shown here, either um, for, for two waves or, or indeed looking across the whole 16 waves where you've got some interesting life cycle things happening um, as well. If you look just over eight year periods, um, one of the things this analysis shows is that um, of those who enter poverty <coughs> at any, in any one year, only 5% of them, looking over the, this kind of period, will be poor continuously over an eight year period. <coughs> they will account for quite a lot of poverty, but, but in terms of are these the same unchanging people who just, they're there and they stay there forever, that's clearly not what's happening. It's obviously a very severe problem for those particular people. But it does not, to me, categorize um, an unchanging um, and cut off um, underclass. Um, and indeed, um, as, as Stephen just showed, um, there, there was a slight reduction in the number of people who would have stayed um, longer term, uh, longer term poor, having started um, in the late 1990s and carried on through the 2000s. It seems to me that his, for all its slightly um, low-tech sound, his rubber band model of um, income dynamics um, is actually a much more sophisticated way of thinking of the world, which policymakers would be well advised to pay attention to. And that's trying to get over what seems to be quite a complicated idea for people to understand. That simultaneously there is lots of mobility, there's a lot of dynamics going on, but most of it is short range. And people don't necessarily leap from, from being out of work to being David Beckham um, in just, one, in just one, one go. And even when it happens, people wobble around and are pulled back by these fixed pins in the rubber band, but in a lot of cases to somewhere much closer to where they started. Um, but also, and there's a lot more detail in this in the book, and this is where the really interesting analysis is, we each have our own rubber band we each have our own starting point to which we're pinned and which, we're, um, which we move around. Um, people's life chances in this rather fluid world do depend on where you've come from and your background. So in part of the book, Stephen is, is measuring um, poverty e exits and entrances in a more sophisticated way. And he shows it in Table 10.2, those of you who buy the book um, afterwards, that there is actually practically no chance that somebody who comes from a two adult family with at least one of them initially in work um, that enters poverty in the first year, there's virtually no chance that they will be continuously poor um, for the next um, for the next years, over the next few years, sorry, if they've got eight levels. Um, but on the other hand, if you contrast that with um, a lone parent who starts out of work, um, and um, I think also out of work actually, um, more than an eighth, 13% of them, um, more with, with, with more children, would still be poor seven years off. So there are some people for whom the mobility um, means that they will, over a long enough period, they will, uh, they're likely not to have stayed continuously poor, but there's a small group of others whose the chances, because of their background, are against them, um, um, 
do not achieve that. And it seems to me that understanding those dynamics, what Stephen came to um, at the end, understanding the entrances and the exits, and why they vary between people, and why it is that for some people having a child pushes them into poverty, and other people having a child does not push them into poverty, why for some people getting a job means that they escape from poverty, but for other people they don't, and what is it that policy can do to make sure that the benign transitions are reinforced and that the unbenign transitions are either avoided or cushioned. It seems to me to be far more helpful than either trying to say that these kind of data tell us that, um, that everybody has this random lottery chance of ending up in particular positions, or characterizing this, this as a world that, where, where the problems we face um, are categorized by an unchanging underclass. Um, I can't imagine there are that many people um, currently up in Manchester um, at the moment um, who are reading um, Stephen's book right now. Um, but I rather hope that it would be very good um, if some of their advisors took the trouble to um, over the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Germany as a down one end and 
the US had had another in terms of how much the social safety net exists in those countries, and Britain's in between. Well, perhaps it's no surprise, uh, you might think that mobility will line up uh, in those various, uh, in the same way that the, the flexibility of the economy and mobility does. Well, most research to date has, has found that you, probably what you would think is very counterintuitive results for the US. That is, mobility in the US, income mobility of this sort of kind, is less in, in uh, the US than in Germany. Okay, so, uh, and th there is, um, so in, in all, the, all these countries, if you push things out far enough, you get a picture like this, we're moving towards um, uh, the rubber bands, of course, are break, uh, breaking up for a long period, but there's still some association with origin. The broad brush things is, is typical, but um, there are there are intuitive and counterintuitive aspects. The second question, a very interesting one, was about the um, whether or not one is able to do analysis of comparing people who are born in Britain and those who come to Britain. The short answer and sad answer is that you can't do the British household panel survey because it's a survey of the pri private household population of Britain in 1991. There are uh, representatives from a large number of ethnic minority groups that, that are in the sample, but given the, the number and diversity of groups, is, the, the numbers of any particular group are too small. And, and then, of course, over, over the 20 years since then, there's been a lot of migration of different kinds to Britain, and those people are not in the sample. However, let me now give an advertisement for British Household Panel Survey's successor, which is called Understanding Society. The, the, the data, um, some data, the data from the first year have become available already and the, there are more coming soon. The British Household Panel, Panel Survey is turning into a bigger, a better, all singing and dancing, all funded by the ESRC and its co-funders uh, survey, which has a much, much bigger sample, uh, including an oversample of ethnic minority groups and so within the next year, two years, we'll be able to say a lot more about these sort of issues for many more sort of groups who live in Britain society today. Uh, the, th the third question was about um, how do we make politicians listen to us? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, very difficult. Um, I think uh, all of us are working in centres that have um, communications advisors uh, and that are helping us get us uh, put put our uh, information in front of people. We have to make it accessible uh, without destroying the main message, which is essentially, I think, what John was saying, and not letting it get uh, changed into um, something that people want to hear rather than what, what's actually going on. But I'm sure John's got more. He actually referred to Peter Lilly. My favourite quote about the research at that time was, was managing to make a front of socialist worker. <laughs> so from two, two, two ends of the spectrum. Um, well, just a, a, a footnote on, on the point on, on migrants, um, which is an advertisement, a shameless advertisement. Um, I am run and, and Stephen is associated with the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion here. Those of you who have just arrived, it's welcome. Um, we do have on our web on our website. If you, if you go to the case web web page, you'll see all our, all our working papers and reports are there. And you will find, if you look back. Um, a, uh, a couple of papers by Richard Dickens and Abigail McKnight who look at a rather narrower question of what happens to the wages of migrants um, over the years, the first few years after they arrive. And you might find that of interest if you're, if you're interested in that. But that's a rather narrower measure of what's going on than, um, than Stephen's concern. <laughs> um, just on the, on the final point, I'm not quite sure where it's gone past, past me, but my experience is that um, there are only two different things that go on here. Um, one is um, what is actually extremely unhelpful, which is the use of the latest research as simply as ammunition for whatever people wanted to argue in the first place. So the, 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 probably a few people who would remember this, but there used to be in the first one for kind of mouthwash um, in Britain um, called Listerine, if it still exists. Um, it was advertised by a dragon called Clifford. And um, in the course of this part of the advertisement, um, the, the voiceover is saying, and recent research shows that, and, and through the door, Clifford's door, the dragon door of his cave, comes a little scroll labeled recent research. And this shows that this mouthwash was very good for you. 
Um, and I often feel that, that um, when our research does get mentioned, does get on the front page of the newspapers, it's precisely for that, that same reason it's simply being used as a prop. Um, where I think the actual effect of, of, of this sort of research and policy comes is a much longer term process. It comes through the gradual change of the way in which people who are thinking about policy, whether they're actually politicians or civil servants or the media um, or people in think tanks, um, or indeed yourselves or the general public or, or whatever, view the world. And obviously, we always have a very simplified model of the world in our heads. But that's all that most of us can cope with. Um, and, and the process of understanding that the world is a bit complicated like this, it's neither one thing nor the other, is maybe something that's seeped through over time, and maybe the, the effect of this sort of thing on policy, I think it's been doing this work for a long time, so I hope it's seeped quite a long way through the system, um, is that maybe some of you in, in 10 years' time will be providing that crucial piece of advice um, to, um, to people formulating policy, maybe not even in Britain, that says, hold on a moment, Let's think about the transitions involved in this. Let's think about the things that make a difference to mobility in the right direction, understand the problem that way. And that's where, that's where this effect comes through. It's not necessarily that Ian Duncan Smith is going to read this immediately, although I can, because Ian Duncan Smith is going to be giving a lecture um, um, on some of these issues, maybe from a different point of view, maybe you know, with less data in it, um, <laughs> um, at the beginning of December. So look out for more details of that. Thank you, John. We'll take another round of three as a question of the inquiry. Hello, my name is Jason Hickel. I'm an anthropologist here at LSE. Um, I find your interests quite innovative and I like them, but, uh, but it's, it's sort of unclear what kind of units and scales you're using in, in G6 here. And, uh, and I wonder if you switched your category from, from 120 to something like one fifth, so quintiles, which is a more common measure, if you would see less mobility, or how would that work? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I'm at a case at the NSE, so I should do it. But I'm interested in, in the attrition rate. Uh, I mean, how many of these people drop out over 16 years? And uh, some must die. And uh, also the change in household was mentioned. Um, Catherine, how does, how does all that affect the results? Perhaps the counterintuitive element of mobility which we show. And also, what sort of people would put up with um, the filling in these details for us to be asking here? Thank you. And a further front, sorry. As a researcher who also uses it in household service, I know you will all be fed in this uh, my name is Harry Davis, I'm a social policy student here at NSC. I was just wondering, looking at the typical 2002 wave, there seems to be like a greater orange bit. Do you know whether there was then, um, in your research, where you came up with any noticeable patterns where socioeconomic groups were, there was greater mobility, say, between <coughs> middle class groups and moving to the poorer groups or the richest group and moving to the downtown, where they varied based on their. Thank you very much for those uh, questions. Units, scales, how you look at it? Yes, I'm using a particular telescope or binoculars, if you will, and if you focus in and out, you'll get different numbers. Um, I, I've done this, these sorts of pictures, you can, or the, the underlying technical name of them is transition matrices, you can do them with split people into fifths, twentieths, tenths, you get the same sort of results as this, broadly speaking, but the numbers, you know, obviously change slightly because you, you, you have changed the, the, uh, the units. But this whole thing about not much mobility, um, but, uh, uh, sorry, quite a lot of mobility but mostly short distance um, persists. And in fact, somewhere in here, there is a... Okay, so in this particular example, there's another one of, of this. So this is looking at, the, the original thing was in, ten, uh, in 20th. This is talking about the proportion of people who say who stay in the same tenth of the income distribution between one year and the next. Okay, so this is um, round circle, solid line, so it's this one. And you can see that that number has not changed very much over time, but it's a different you know, number, sort of thing that's going on. Okay, so 
good point, but I, in a sense, I don't, I don't think that is a, a really material issue in, in, in these sort of global summaries of mobility. Ian, attrition, yes. Uh, in the BHPS, there was quite a lot at the beginning of that, as in common with, with most household panels, virtually all the drop off is between the first year and the next. And then from then subsequently over time, around 5% drop out each year, broadly speaking. Now, of course, if you accumulate 5% each year over time, that produces relatively large numbers. Okay, so, um, but of course, there are people coming in, people joining households and so on, so there's some offsetting there. So there is, the, the panel is reproducing itself like the population does, immigration part. Um, so there is that as an offsetting thing. The really key thing about attrition, though, is, is, is it's two effects. One is, in effect, I think part of what you're saying was, um, surely it makes the sample go down. Yes, but that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, it, it does might for some small groups. The more important issue is whether or not it's um, particular groups that are dropping out relative, rather than others. Uh, and there are various things you can do about that. You can use the so-called um, weights in the survey that are, are a means of adjusting your statistics to take account of the sort of people who drop out differentially. You can do other sorts of model-based analyses. But it turns out that, broadly speaking, that attrition is not a big deal for these sorts of analysis. I mean, that's, uh, I would say that, wouldn't I? But uh, <laughs> there is that. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, research that backs that up, and it's also consistent with stuff that's going on in the US as well. This is whether or not you do simple statistics or model-based stuff. But part of the reason is that um, attrition tends to be relatively random once you control for a few things. Um, and and uh, it, this is, it seems to be a common pattern around, uh, around the world, in fact, the US as well. Um, Owen's question was about, um, I think, Differences over time, whether the things have been changing over time, about which I've talked quite a lot, but also about asymmetries, mm -hmm. movements down from the, up from the bottom and down from the top, and whether or not that changed over time. The short, the short answer is, uh, I didn't look at this a lot. I mean, there are, back to on those, on those charts that we saw before, there were some asymmetries. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that all the stuff about property dynamics, the movements out of low income, mm -hmm. is an asymmetry because we're looking just to be focusing at the bottom. I mean, I just, to think, some extent, I think I'm, I might be avoiding what you, you were trying to ask me, but I'm, I'm not sure. That, ask me at the reception, not very well. Um, yeah. I'm just going to add slightly to, to that uh, final question, was um, mobility is a very neutral term. It's, as as uh, we've been finding out, it's uh, actually perceiving a lot of very subtle and complicated things. So, uh, on average, mobility is up and down. There are obviously some groups who are mostly going to be going down and others going up. Some suffer just enormous amounts of volatility. And I think all of those groups are going to be different groups. So I think I, I suspect there isn't a single answer to, to, to the question. So, a lot, a lot of these pictures, by the way, are controlling the systematic variation between one year and the next for people's income and age. You might expect people in their 20s and 30s to be on the trajectory that's going up. There. And if, you, if you take out those changes, which of course for one is the next not particularly big, but nonetheless they might be providing an upward impetus. Mm -hmm. Basically, it doesn't affect things very much, in part because the horizon is small. That's why if you go to the longer term trajectories, that you do see that there's more systematic association with age on average. But there are also other big things that really matter. Not only age, some of those trajectories are, are not what economists refer to as hump shape, they're actually relatively flat. And it's things about whether or not you're a woman or a man, or your educational qualifications, which make a huge difference. Thank you. We'll take another round. Um, yes. Hello. Uh, my name is John Clancy. I'm visiting here from from Dublin, visiting in case. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the, uh, the connections that you might draw between this kind of research and the intergenerational uh, income mobility that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, when you compare your first wave, you know, you, 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 you've covered 16 years here, which is a fair long stretch of time, and if you shifted out another little bit, you'd actually have the length of the generation. 
uh, so it would be, <laughs> I'm just interested to know what you think. Uh, is, is this building to a similar type of picture that you get from the intergenerational mobility? Or is it fitting with it? Um, how does the income of a person say that you picked up at age 30 compared to the age of, say, 46? Uh, they might have had a, you know, well, at age 30, they wouldn't have a 15 year old, but say at age 35, they, would have, they could well have a 15 year old, and that 15 year old would then be 31 by the time your, 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 your season's finished. So you're getting into similar territory, and I'd just be interested to know how the two line up. Thanks, Steve, to find lost your question on the slide there, but it's a good question I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hassan Hassan. I'm a student here at the LSE, and I come from Bahrain. Um, I particularly enjoyed listening to your talk because uh, research and uh, income mobility and social mobility in Bahrain is uh, pretty scarce and underdeveloped. And uh, given the recent events, I think uh, we would do well to uh, uh, apply some sort of the kind of insight we've been giving to, uh, uh, to our country. Um, my question is, um, have you seen or have you observed any correlation uh, between uh, particular public policies uh, or the types of government that the governments that have been in office um, over the, the, the period of study uh, with any trends that, that, you, might, that you might have observed? Um, have you seen any sort of correlation? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evelyn Astor. I'm a new master's student in the Department of Social Policy, so I look forward to meeting some of you. Um, like my fellow American over there, I was rather surprised by the sixth chart, um, the rainbow chart, uh, which demonstrated a, a pretty considerable degree of uh, social mobility. Um, and I was very surprised not only by the degree of social mobility um, in, from poverty dynamics perspective from uh, upward mobility uh, for people who uh, in, the, in the poor income ranges, but also the downward um, poverty for people in the higher income ranges. And I was wondering in your book or in your research, if you've done any research on um, the factors that lead to this downward mobility for the higher income groups. Thanks very much. Uh, Tony, the, you're quite right to draw attention to this. I mean, every generation is a connection of uh, within generation spells, and so they, they, they have to line up. But uh, interestingly, people don't typically do that. Um, the closest I've got to it is the trajectory based stuff that is going on here. And as you know, a lot of the, the stuff on um, intergenerational mobility, particularly if you come from uh, Oxford or Stockholm, is the OED model, Origins Education Destinations. And uh, we've got education and we've got destinations here. Um, what we haven't got is that missing link to do with the, the, the parental income or the parental education. But it could be made. Um, I, I haven't done it, and partly because of the description stuff that was going to be on. I think that's an interesting challenge. The problem that people have used PHDS to do um, intergenerational mobility of the sort, but there's a limit that one, uh, what one can do, certainly in terms of income terms, because we only have 17 years. If, if you move to um, some of my, my, my former colleagues have done stuff using low gold foot scales based on employment history, so you can go back a bit further. But again, there's a limit. And part of the problem is that the HPS is now checked, stopped, and so we have to move to another data set. So I think it's a really interesting and important issue, but um, uh, it, most of it's to be done in the future. The second question uh, from a uh, student from Bahrain was very interesting um, about it basically what does, I think you in effect you were saying that the political colour uh, from the left to the right, the different types of government may actually made a difference. Um, and I, and I emphasise in the book um, the nature of the analysis that I'm doing here, which is really um, describing what's going on here. This is not an analysis of particular policies that were introduced by particular governments at times. Um, people like Mike that have been doing that sort of analysis. This is a much more broad brush over, overview, if you will. But that said, um, I'll stick my neck out and say, you know, I referred to in the, in the last slide about the smoking guns. Okay, I think Labour did make a difference. So if, basically, we're talking about outcomes here, which are income, which are to do with money. 
If you give low-income families with children and you give, give pensions with more money, you know, it shows up. And that's effectively what's going on here. We're now in a different world. Now, so I think that sort of answers your question. But I think, of course, that's stepping beyond some of the sorts of things, the conclusions that you can draw from analysis. I refer to smoking guns and I also refer to the state of the economy being particularly important. 1991 unemployment was the last uh, big recession before the, the crisis at the end of 2007-2008. The economy was gradually improving over this time. Um, so this, you know, that is also important. Uh, third question was um, to do with uh, you know, more surprise about how the US fits in. Um, you know, I guess we all, we all learn a lot about um, what's going on and there is a, a lot happens to all sorts of people. I mean, you have to be a little careful. Remember when we were talking about the, the, the rainbow pictures, that rainbow pictures were described as people, people's position was to, described in terms of their rank in the distribution. It's possible to fall from the top tenth to the next top tenth and still have a higher income if everybody's income is trending up. Okay, so this, this is what I'm going back to what I was saying before about whether or not mobility is to do with just reshuffling of positions or to do with whether it's genuine real income growth. The second part of your question was, have you looked at the factors that determine whether or not people, the, those people who do fall, um, what happens to them? The short, answer, the short answer to that question is no, because a lot of the analysis, certainly at the back end of the book, the multi-merit analysis, was focusing on poverty dynamics. So if people fell from the very top and fell below the poverty line, they're in. Um, but otherwise, a lot of the book doesn't really consider falls from the top. Thank you. We'll take one more round and then finish as a lady in the back and then have to get the opposite now. Hi, I'm Jane Hill. I'm um, is there a part of the consequence of the making 2006 pattern of mobility much better compared to the present years? Um, I'm very impressed that the period of privatization and the general administration shows clear structure. And uh, no particular global event seems not that we are affecting the structure. Show me um, your research uh, highlighted the very strong foreign power of regulations of institutions that are uh, those uh, labor market structure. Very interesting. And also, I think the government will be very interested in research. Uh, the fields of research do not include uh, Lehman Shock in 2008, but those massive job and benefits of 2019 and the public they will be very interested in how they present the data to the public. Thank you. Uh, James Kai, HSG for the world and former uh, social policy student here. Um, my question was regarding the, a potential correlation between the bottom 5% um, and this idea of persistent poverty, remaining in poverty three or four times over a period of four years. And is there a stronger correlation between um, that 5% and, and that um, phenomenon? Is that something you looked at? And is that something that can be looked at, bearing in mind that the, the bottom 5% are 250 I think you said it's a 5,000 5, members of the survey, so that, by my reckoning, is 250. And that links to the question on data of attrition. Um, is that group potentially more likely to suffer from attrition? And does that mean that it's, it's, it doesn't give us any meaningful results or could it? Thank you. On the last question, we'll stick up the top, so we may be asking. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering if your research looked at housing tenure, and if so, what did it reveal? I can answer that very quickly. <clears throat> the short answer is I didn't look at it. <laughs> uh, so far, except of course, um, taking into account measuring income, uh, it, housing taking is not pulled out as a particular factor. Um, and James' questions about uh, being stuck at the bottom, 
And to be honest, I would be very reluctant to do too much about the poorest 5%. Um, the numbers are down there are greater than you think because we're looking at individuals also. So it's 5% of 10,000 rather than 5% of 5,000 in terms of you know, adults. So more of the country. But it's still the same income within the household. So you can understand. What's going on down there is people like Mike and his colleagues um, have shown um, that there is right down at the very bottom of particular problems with measure and error and reporting um, that, are, that, are, that cause problems. So I mean, one, one's got to be very careful about what this is. The poorest five percent, that's possibly you know, digging a bit too far down. And um, I don't go that far most of the, most of the time. Um, and that's it. To some extent, I guess that's an advantage of um, just looking at whether or not people are below, below the line, I mean, the, the standard poverty line. Um, there are always measurement issues that you've hit on a very big one. And the other question, I'm afraid there was, there was a lot, you raised so many interesting issues, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to defer to talk to you at the reception. <laughs> um, I, I, I was unable, unable to, to formulate an answer off the, off the top of my head. Well, can, can I take the opportunity just to um, relate to part of what you said at the end, which is, um, related to some of the other points as well, which is that. Um, all of this does take, describe a world before the collapse of Lehman Brothers and before the Great Recession started. So, um, although it's not actually about mobility, Stephen has modestly not mentioned the fact that he's been coordinating uh, an international program on the effects of the Great Recession on income inequality in different countries. You might have seen it on the front pages of newspapers a couple of weeks ago. And we will be having a seminar with a little break, but later on in the term, Stephen will be talking about that work. Um, so look out for, for that part, which does take, not exactly the dynamic story forward, but it does take forward a part of the analysis of the effect of the recession um, on, um, on income inequality. And that's obviously another story, um, but um, I think we're seeing to be doing a great deal of work recently. The old commission. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, Simon, any last words? Stephen, any last words? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.